shortly. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I call the meeting of this advisory medical need to order. I'm Tom Alasco. I'll just take a quick roll call of our subcommittee members. Um, Jim Rodenoff, you can be here present. I'm present. Uh, Meg? Present. And then we also have uh, Chairman Pepper in attendance as well. And that's it from the board. That's right. Okay. And then we do not have Dr. Clifton on the call yet. Uh, she calls all, all notifier for the roll call. So since this is our first subcommittee committee meeting, I wanted just to do brief, very brief uh, introductions because we've got a lot of, to do and discuss. And I'll be speaking really quickly. Uh, again, I'm Tom Nolasco. I'm general counsel for the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, or the NACB, a national trade organization that specializes in creating standards and best practices for the cannabis industry. Our goal is to legitimize and elevate the growing cannabis marketplace. And part of our function is to consult with various state legislators and regulators as we are doing in this engagement. Uh, my background is a 20-year attorney uh, in commercial business litigation. I've been in the cannabis space for about seven or eight years, starting with partnership disputes uh, between cannabis license holders. And like any other um, business, they have needs of compliance and employment in the state. I served on this Arizona where I'm based on panels for cannabis and then throughout the country on issues like licensing, social equity, 280E. So it's my privilege to be able to coordinate uh, these subcommittee meetings and create some good policy for the state of Vermont. So um, I have Jim Romanoff serving on this subcommittee. Do you just want to give a brief introduction, Jim? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tom. I'm Jim Romanoff, and I'm currently the chair of uh, the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. And I've been on the committee for several years, four years. Um, and because of that position, serving on the advisory panel as well. And Thanks. my background is, is uh, in, in private business and publishing, uh, as well as uh, <clears throat> other media and communication uh, related businesses, mostly around food and uh, gardening and agriculture. Thank you, Jim. And Meg Delia? Hi, I'm Meg Delia. Um, I represent the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association. Um, I have worked now with them for about four years. My background is in public health as well as in the medical field. Great. Thank you, Meg. And thank you both uh, time and service on the subcommittee. I know we have some members of the public uh, attending the subcommittee meeting as well. I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that written public comments can be submitted electronically via the web form on the CCB website, and that has been available since May 2021. And I wanted to ensure everyone that your comments have been received, uh, reviewed and considered by each and every subcommittee member, and we certainly appreciate your input. There will be a time for public comments and questions toward the end of the hour, as there will be with every meeting going forward. Um, and in addition, the CCB will be hosting dedicated meetings for public comments, both at their Friday board meeting via public link or at the CCB's public comment evenings. Uh, that will also be posted on their website. So your voice will be heard and considered, uh, but we do have pressing deadlines on us and it's critical that we have some constructive communications between the board members to meet those deadlines. So I don't want the hour to be dominated by public comments. Uh, but certainly you will have an opportunity at the end of uh, each meeting and also you can address your concerns through those avenues that I've discussed. So I just want to make sure we still don't have uh, Dr. Clifton who will also be on this subcommittee. And I disseminated some of the uh, reference materials for this meeting and going forward as you're aware. Uh, the, the enabling legislation for the subcommittee are Acts 62 and 164 uh, that I included the pertinent portions of those acts um, and unlike some of the other subcommittees that I've been on all, <laughs> all day today we do have the benefit of some existing regulations as well as the 2019 report authored by our very own uh, Mr. Jim Romanoff but 
with the advent of this legalization, we've got a golden opportunity uh, to identify areas to enhance and improve uh, the medical cannabis program for our patients in the state of Vermont. So let's begin with the, some of the issues that I wanted to, to identify um, that we can get agreement on to tackle uh, with this group. And I'd like to hear, obviously, from the subcommittee members. Um, and we can modify and prioritize as you see fit. But one of the things that's happening, it's not exclusive to Vermont, but when uh, adult use comes online, it's ensuring that the, the medical cannabis community and those patients uh, have the continued care and service uh, and they're not marginalized in any way. And so I'd like to hear just uh, both of your thoughts on some of the supply issues the last few years and uh, ideas on how to protect medical patient access um, to the product that they need. Do you want to go first, Meg, or? Sure. Um, so in terms of really keeping the medical program viable, I think the our first and foremost priority is really access. Um, without a large enough program, I think it will be difficult to uh, maintain the current medical program. Um, so access, expanding that, making it known that this program is available to Vermonters and making it a program that isn't more restrictive um, than adult use. So, you know, just like for adult use, you could walk into any dispensary and purchase cannabis. Um, right now in medical, for example, you can't do that. You have to designate a dispensary. And there are a number of items like that that um, I think will kind of push people into the adult use market rather than medical just because of all those hoops they have to jump through. Um, so addressing access is definitely my priority. Thank you. Jim, do you have any comments? Yeah, I would, I would agree uh, completely uh, about access. We've, we've had a lot of, uh, at our oversight committee hearings, uh, a lot of concern expressed by board members and uh, members of the public that uh, in the in the rush to uh, the adult use market and the money that can be made there that the uh, medical program will uh, suffer that you know that if, if uh, both access is I think a really important point and I have some things that I can address on that but besides uh, I think having access to the program uh, you know adults can can go to uh, adult use products if they're cheaper uh, there's other things like cost as well uh, I think that uh, you know ensuring that the program that it itself is comparable to what uh, is available in other states in terms of uh, product variety uh, testing, all those types of things. And, you know, we have a good program, but there's a long way to go uh, in terms of the kinds of products that are available. So definitely uh, access, uh, definitely, you know, the program improving itself uh, in terms of products availability uh, and testing. Um, you know, I think another issue for access, which uh, Vermont patients are interested in is reciprocity. Uh, we can go to another state and use uh, their medical dispensaries, uh, use them up in Maine. Um, other medical patients can't do that here. Um, I'm assuming that that would support the, the business side of our uh, dispensaries if other patients uh, were able to come in uh, and purchase from the, the dispensaries. But, uh, you know, I think, I think that the people are looking for uh, some the signs of protection of the of the patients and the medical program and I think we need to consider the patient who's the lowest common denominator who can't isn't speaking up and isn't showing up at these meetings can maybe barely afford uh, medical cannabis and uh, has difficulty maybe even physically getting it so uh, you know for those people I think being able to uh, let people know that uh, we're going to watch out and not let the program uh, slip during this period. Thank you both. And I, I, I've got some follow-up questions for that, but I think uh, 
Dr. Clifton just joined us. Dr. Clifton, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Thanks, Hi, Dr. Tom. Hi. We, um, we got underway, but if you could just say a quick hello and give a quick introduction. Oh, thank you, everybody. I had some uh, unexpected misdirected travel and a terrible uh, night last night, so sorry to be joining you a bit late. Dr. Uh, Clifton, I'm internal medicine, 25 years, the founder of CBD and Cannabis Info.com, my 200 free video website and education product, just basically medical and scientific consultation in the uh, cannabis space. So looking forward to contributing here with you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Clifton. And uh, I, I had just posed the question. Uh, um, I mean, the first issue uh, I wanted to address was uh, the protection of the existing medical patients um, as adult use comes online. And what Meg and Jim had talked about was um, ensuring access, cost, uh, product availability, variety, testing, and, and reciprocity, and those were some of the issues that, that we ticked through. Can you just give me a sense of, um, I, because for example, like I, I know in Illinois, even when the, the program was still just medical, um, there were, and obviously, you know, um, there's population difference, but they couldn't keep up with, with the demand. In Vermont, uh, there's, I, I'm aware of the issues just of, uh, kind of geographical difficulties or, or strains for certain people. But I, I mean, do, Meg and Jim, do, do, do you have a sense of what the, what the supply and demand metrics look like for the, the medical patients? Was there, you know, were there, were there vast um, shortages like in some other states or was, it, was, it, was there some equilibrium and how that might be affected going forward uh, as we open up to adult use? Jim, do you want to go for a few things? Sure. Um, you know, uh, I, I am chairman of the Oversight Committee, but I'm a patient as well. Uh, you know, there has been always a, a supply, and I would say that it's limited. I couldn't say whether it's limited because of the difficulty in growing it or the economics of it. It is certainly limited in terms of variety, uh, strains, number of strains. Part of that is difficult to legally import them uh, and, and get them going in Vermont. But uh, it's, I'm sure, also a matter of business. And, and using uh, a broad uh, spectrum of, of strains, varieties, chemotypes uh, is a very effective approach, according to many people. It has been for me. Um, so the supply has never been what it is elsewhere. It's always been limited here, the number one. Um, and I, I do want to say one quick thing that I, I do want to point people to the 2019 report uh, that you mentioned because I think that it does outline points really specifically that speak to uh, what Meg was saying about uh, access uh, as well as all these other issues of uh, access related to cost and uh, uh, you know geographical uh, uh, considerations, all those kinds of things. So I did want to just mention that again. But to answer your question, I think the supply has been uh, limited already, and uh, so you know I would hope it doesn't get more limited. Again, other states do better. Yeah, th thank you, Jim. I did reference your report and the existing regulations in the reference material. I, I didn't send that to you because you, you sent it to me. I, I assume Meg has that. I sent it to Dr. Clifton as well. So. We all have the benefit of that, and that's obviously a good resource for us and a good starting point. Um, Meg, did you have uh, anything to add, any color to yeah. add on supply? So I think in terms of supply, um, as Jim said, it's absolutely limited. And I think where we, as the dispensaries, run into an issue with providing you know, not only a large supply, but also a diverse offering of products is that right now the program is so small that economically it is really difficult for us to be able to you know, grow all of these strains, produce all of these products and allocate all of those resources when our patient base um, you know, over the past few years has decreased. And so with 
fewer consumers. Uh, just economically, it doesn't always make sense to uh, really just increase all of the resources to provide a variety. Um, so I think there is that, and as Jim said, without um, interstate commerce, there are definitely the complications of how are you, you know, getting um, seeds for a new strain, et cetera. That absolutely poses some difficulties. And then of course now with COVID, I think we're seeing um, quite a delay in supply chain of other materials that maybe impacts um, our final products that are going to the dispensaries. Right, thank you. So well, one of the considerations um, is with, with the expansion, the coming expansion of the market uh, from the adult use patients or, or customers, um, will that will that spurn uh, the supply side because of the greater number of cultivators or growers? Um, and to what extent will that just service then the adult use community, or will the the medical community benefit from that as well? Um, or will we have the opposite effect where maybe there'll be some stagnation on the supply side or, or cultivator side and then you have greater demand um, from the adult use market that will marginalize the access to um, the medical community, right? Th those, are, those are some of the concerns that, that I have at least going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think our hope is that with adult use, um, whether it is the revenue gain from that or, um, as you alluded to, the growers that we're working with, um, hopefully we will be able to commit more resources to a more um, diverse product offering, uh, have the funding to do so, and then um, really depending on the rules that we um, will learn more about hopefully in coming months, you know, whether or not the product from craft growers could also be sold to medical dispensaries or is that only adult use. Um, so getting clarity there, I think, will help determine that answer. Uh, I would add into that that, you know, I, I would hope that the adult use market uh, benefits medical, but, you know, I don't see any reason to be assume that it definitely will <clears throat> because usually money speaks unless there's a regulation in place. So, you know, I, I think there's a baseline of, of products that are available to medical patients. And I think one of the pieces that we have to talk about is not just the raw flour and the raw product, but the processing and the processed product that would assume, <clears throat> I don't have these numbers, but that the majority of patients are using a, uh, a tincture, a concentrate, uh, a product that's been transformed into something they can digest, uh, sublingual, all these different things. And so ensuring that there's a baseline of products that the medical patients are getting now, and it's, it's not a huge variety. So being able to ensure that those stay and are, are continually made at the same level, it, I would think would be important. Now, there are hopefully with the broadening of the market, there will be similar uh, varieties and products that do similar things. These are going to exist at strengths that are not going to be the same as the adult use market. So they are different. The concentrates might be the same, but the products are going to end up being different. So hopefully the variety will expand eventually and, they'll, and we'll be able to educate patients. If this works for you, now there's five things that are like that available and hopefully we can do that and it will benefit the patients. But in the short term, I don't think we have a guarantee and you know, to be able to look for uh, some uh, uh, sort of a sense of security for the patients and feeling that they can at least count on for a certain while uh, the product that they're using now uh, uh, to be available as the market transitions, I think would be important. Yeah, um, thank you for that. So I, I have two, two follow-up points. One, in a separate subcommittee, the, the market structure licensing and fees uh, subcommittee, we just received or were walked through the market analysis 
um, that I will send to both of you um, because that kind of helps dictate every other subcommittee. Um, the second thing is, as to your, <laughs> it's funny. So I've been I've been in every subcommittee all, all, all six of them today, um, and it, there's there's usually differing perspectives. In the sustainability committee of all committees, well, we talked about um, the the product landscape and, and what might be coming in the future. The comment was made, well, this is Vermont, people like flour. And then the counter to that was, well, you know, nationally at least, um, as far as what, what sales look like for your average dispensary, at least half of them are probably uh, on, on the, the edible side now, that's probably going to be growing, uh, and the comment was made, especially typically kind of the older and in, in, in the medical community mm -hmm. moving away from from flour. So, uh, and there there was some agreement about that, but I mean I think you're right. I think it's going to keep continue to trend that way uh, so when new products. And, and one thing I would say also is that you know I don't think the medical patient is the typical. Uh, cannabis consumer, and that is what we have to look out for. I mean, there are people who are sent in desperation with a terminal illness, uh, and they might have never tried cannabis ever before, and yet it's what's going to get them through it. So, they, you know, comments about what Vermonters like and what, you know, I'm not sure it all pertains uh, to what the medical patient needs. Right. And I think we also have to, uh, um, you know, continue to carve a space out for concentrates for the medical patient, for the seizure patient who's developed a high tolerance for THC and needs to use a concentrated THC formulation, or for somebody with panic disorder or migraine headache who needs a uh, rapid administration for a rapid resolution of the, uh, of the symptoms. The, uh, the dabs or BSO or hashish, those are products that are, are that do have a, a, a weirdly have a position in the medical uh, space. When I, I don't think that people see them as immediately medical products. Um, does the subcommittee feel like uh, like uh, positioning home grow prominently in the uh, in in the discussion will will really help the uh, medical cannabis patient in Vermont to to have to you know overcome the issues of availability of product. That, that's no. something they have dealt with, it and they can talk about that. Go ahead, guys. Uh, I would just say from my own experience, it is not for the faint of heart, and if you need, no. we live in Vermont. Okay, so <clears throat> being an indoor grower is very complicated. Things, you know, no, uh, it's it, it's a whole different environment that you're creating. Outdoor growing, we live in Vermont. It's a short season. It's a odd weather. Uh, if you're counting on this for medicine, you could lose it all uh, to worms or a frost or a blight. Uh, and I think that we're not we don't have a marketplace yet where consumers have confidence in growing cannabis. I think they will. I don't think it's a lot different. We're avid gardeners in Vermont, but we're not there yet. Because mostly people who grow cannabis or have in the past in closets are telling people how to do it. And it sounds scary and not doable. So we'll get there, but not yet. Well, you know, I have to say I feel similarly that I, I mean, I'm not a gardener. Uh, but it does seem like for a lot of people with limited incomes and uh, limited uh, mobility, uh, the you know, a, 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 and a green thumb, that the home grow uh, may offer a, a nice opportunity for for a lot of people in one of these closet situations. Or I know you can buy these freestanding, you know, spaces where you can grow there. That, that, I think that should be something we should uh, not use as an excuse to not really shore up the supplies in the dispensaries for medical, but also in this committee make sure that we keep that available for people. You know, I, I would agree with Jim, um, you know, on the initial kind of uh, reaction in that, yes, uh, we certainly have a, a significant part of our medical population that do grow. 
But I think what a lot of medical patients are coming into the dispensaries for is not necessarily just the flour that they could grow at home. They're products that really are um, lab tested, safe, uh, uh, consistently dosed, uh, reliable, consistent, and even though it may, um, you know, at first glance appear to be the more financially viable option for somebody who, uh, you know, maybe is interested in saving some money and growing at home, I think, as Jim alluded to, you could lose it all at once. So all of that money that you put in um, could be resulting in nothing in the end. And I think that's a significant risk for a lot of patients to potentially lose their medicine. Um, and if they are concerned with contaminants or anything like that, they will end up with those uh, costs of lab testing, which the dispensaries are already doing. So as much as I think home grow is an important part of the medical program, I, I don't know that I would say that that's something I would um, want to put at the forefront of this committee's priorities. Right. So, so just getting back to, and this is still on the, the first issue of how do we protect the existing medical patients as we transition over to adult use. Jim, for your 2019 report, did you get a sense, were there any studies done, and, and this is to your suggestion of, we've got to ensure that baseline of products for the medical community, um, or have that safety net. I mean, how, how do we go about finding what what that is, or, or those numbers. Was that part of the, the report or any studies done for that? No, I'm, I'm not aware of specific uh, studies that were done of, at that granular level of what, uh, how cannabis was being used as a product, what was, you know, concentrates, flowers, that, that type of thing. Um, I would say that given we have a limited number of dispensaries uh, in Vermont, and we have a limited number of patients right now, it wouldn't be that difficult to determine, you know, I've looked at my dispensary's menu, uh, it's pretty, and I don't mean that this in a, in a negative way, it's just, it's limited, so I could, you know, to ensure what's on there, I don't think would take much of a, of a, you know, discovery process to see what's there. I think the dispensaries, uh, you know, have information, I'm sure, uh, about products that are, you know, more important to their patients in terms of what they're getting versus not. And I assume given it's been a, a, a difficult business for them uh, in these years, when I applaud that they've, they've made it through it, you know, uh, that things have weeded out, that it, it's there because either a patient absolutely begs to have it, even if it's not cost effective to make, or it's there because it meets the standard of you know, it's good business and the patients are using it. So, you know, from my point of view right now, I just want more variety. There's always more you can get, but you could look at the menus right now and say, you know, in these categories, we want to make sure that there's uh, this type of concentrated product, this type of flour, uh, you know, and that they're available for X number of months during, you know, the changeover, uh, you know, Again, I'm not in the dispensary business, but besides the, you know, demand for processing and whatnot, the strains are there and they're growing. Uh, the dispensaries, I'm sure, are eager to grow new genetics and all that type of stuff. But you know, I'm growing those strains. They they gave me cuttings. I'm, but, so it's there. It can be done. I don't think it's the biggest thing. And you know, uh, I think ensuring it. Uh, I don't know whether it is just a, a commitment. <laughs> I don't know whether that that will satisfy a lot of uh, the the you know concerns I've heard from both our board and the public. So. Yeah, and and uh, again, I'll, I'll, I will send you that market analysis, and it, there's got to be a way to extrapolate like what what's what's existing now because they don't, it was just medical sales uh, until now, and using that to form our baseline. I would suggest having as a, you know, testimony from, you know, or, or a written testimony from uh, the dispensaries just of what they're, you know, where they are with the product would be a good idea. And we can gauge their, you know, uh, both, I wouldn't call it appetite, but their ability to, you know, uh, in good conscience, keep the, the medical products going and 
expand in this new marketplace. It, it's not so big, it shouldn't be possible. Right. If, I mean, if, if, if you've got those contacts and you want to reach out um, and they, they can develop that for us, that would be extremely helpful. I, I don't know there would be better for me or you, Meg. That's your, your peeps. So Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, 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 I just think right. we should work with the, the dispensaries and we'll see what, what they're prepared for. None of this is a surprise. To, to them, right. they, they, their patients are talking to them every day. They don't have any recreational patients yet with all you. So they're only hearing worried patients, I'm sure. Right. So we'll, yeah. we'll do that. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, I, I've got as other items to consider as far as is not opportunity to review the medical program um, and where, you know some of its shortcomings were and how we can better serve the community. And I know you both have testified. I mean, one of them, one of those issues, I think, Meg, you were talk, talking about this, was just address, addressing qualifying conditions. Um, do, do you just want to speak on that and, and, and what we can do to improve uh, yeah. the, the program? Absolutely. So as you all know, there's a list of qualifying conditions currently. Um, those conditions were determined not necessarily by individual physicians, but um, by the state. And so I feel strongly that we should allow healthcare providers to determine what is or isn't a qualifying condition um, for their patient. I think um, you know, as especially in the last couple of years, there's been an increase in sleep disorders, anxiety and panic disorders. Um, those are not on the list, but we've heard from physicians who have said uh, they would like to recommend medical cannabis for that. Um, and I, I just think that the doctors are the ones who have been trained um, and they should be the one determining what is or is not qualifying. Um, I, I think we could also expand the list and really kind of drill down and just keep listing. But at that point, um, I think we're faced with kind of an ever-growing list. There will always be something to add. Um, so why not put it in the hands of the healthcare professionals now? And Dr. Clifton, I'm sure you have some feedback or some, some comments on that. Oh, I love the idea of making, uh, of giving doctors uh, plenty of room to just uh, make decisions. I mean, um, at the vast, vast majority of people coming in for medical cannabis, uh, I think in my experience, which mirrors uh, national registries, is going to be chronic pain, insomnia, and of course anxiety. So having PTSD and anxiety as a uh, as a diagnosis that can uh, that can uh, fall under the treatment of medical cannabis would be helpful, and um, mm -hmm. I agree with all that. Yeah, Jim, I, I'll I'll let you comment as well. I, I'm just thinking about this from a from a legislator's perspective. I don't know if just giving CART launch to uh, a healthcare professional. Um, would be the most palatable uh, mm -hmm. recommendation. But certainly, uh, Doctor, you're, you're referencing the National Registry. So if, if we could support um, at least an expanse, more expansive list uh, that's not currently included, I don't know, I don't think, is anxiety, anxiety is usually kind of a, a touchstone one. Is that included, Meg, in the, in the current qualifying conditions for Vermont? Most of the time it's not included, sorry to interrupt you Meg, but then a PTSD is included in a more progressive state and right. then when a doctor is doing the card, if a person has anxiety as their primary diagnosis, we use that anxiety diagnosis as the patient's pain and so we'll, we'll put the card in as a pain card with anxiety being the pain diagnosis. So it, we, it, that's the workaround, sort of the general workaround for somebody or a lot of times you can find an anxiety patient who has some intermittent back pain or arthritis pain somewhere. And so we can work it in as a pain card. Right, um, but yeah, so if you understand my suggestion, maybe, maybe if we could develop that, that list at least, uh, just as an alternative. I mean, 
I, I hear you and, and Meg saying let let the healthcare provider decide. Um, but as a fallback, I'd like to have at least a list that's more expansive than, than the one now to, to expand the program for the qualifying conditions that we can support uh, with what, what's going on in other states as well. And would it be helpful to have language from other states who have adopted um, allowing healthcare providers to determine yes. health conditions? Okay, I can certainly find that. You know, I, I think it is important to remember that in the way it works in Vermont, the and, and I don't want to just say doctor, I would want to say, you know, a healthcare provider because nurse practitioners, uh, psychologists, there's many practitioners, uh, uh, you know, nature of paths, osteopaths should be also, I think, able to uh, recommend people to the program. And that's really what we have here. It, it is not you know, a, a doctor or healthcare provider is just saying, uh, I work with this patient and uh, for this long, and they have this condition. It says nothing, they're, they're not recommending cannabis. Uh, they're just saying they have this condition. They're inadvertently recommending it by letting them be in the, in the program. So, you know, that's one thing that down the road might need to be addressed here in Vermont is how healthcare professionals are referring people to the program. It's very backwards now, and it's meant to, I believe, protect them from having to say, I'm, I'm asking you to do something that was currently at that time illegal. Now, as adult use opens up, it seems to me that you know a medical program needs to be uh, less restrictive, obviously, uh, than a, an adult use program. It's, it's it regulated in a certain way. And you would not say to a doctor, you know, uh, you can't, most prescriptions can be prescribed off label. If a doctor decides I'm gonna, you know, prescribe, uh, you know, a anti-spasmodic for sleep, they'll do it. So, you know, moving in that direction is probably a, a good idea. I don't know, you know, the logic for our legislature to give up uh, the control, I think you're right. Right now it's certain conditions, but they're going to be, you know, every adult's going to be able to, to get cannabis in some form uh, legally. So, you know, I think when we're talking about uh, medical products, the point of view will change over the next few years. I do hope our conditions list can be as, as inclusive as possible. Um, and just because time's uh, flying by, some of what I, I want to cover also is uh, potency issues, uh, caregiver delivery concerns, and then whatever else uh, you see as improvements that we can make to the medical program. But um, on the potency, uh, I mean, it's it's within the act, uh, kind of the caps, and then there's discussions about um, medical not not having some of those. What, what is what what are your perspectives on on caps? You know, as a patient, I would say you just, it's counterproductive. Uh, you know, the, some things take an incredibly concentrated uh, approach to effect. And I think, you know, we're, we're still talking about a uh, medicine that in many ways is, is in its infancy here uh, in terms of how we're formulating it. So, it's a little bit of a hunt. You learn what works and what doesn't work. And putting caps on it will make it less effective. Uh, and I don't believe, you know, there's been a substantial, uh, you know, uh, amount of product going from a medical market into an adult use market. I don't think that's ever turned out to be a major concern in Vermont. So uh, I don't see why we would limit them. It, it would not be good for for uh, patients at all. If Vermont is, as, as a state is trying to limit their concentrated THC products, uh, similar to the way Iowa is, uh, a THC waiver can be created. In Iowa, when I do cards, I have to uh, do a THC waiver. The patient is supposed to try the existing medical cannabis products for a month. And then if they don't get the relief that they were looking for, they can circle back and then 
Uh, but the you know the problem with that waiver is that I don't I don't charge for it when I do my cards, but a lot of people will charge for that, and they probably should because it it has its level of time consumption to make another appointment and have another conversation with the patient. Um, so, and, and it's another hoop for a patient who requires high THC. So it could be something, but sometimes people don't really know what they need when they first come mm -hmm. either. So, and, and, but sometimes they do, and then that one month wait using uh, lower concentrations products is, you know, I mean, is a, it's, just a, it's, just another, it's just another hoop. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I think limiting the concentration is, is just creating more barriers to access for patients. It's impossible to predict, especially for dispensary staff, how one person, uh, you know, their biology is going to react to THC. So, it, you know, we can't say, oh, well, you'll never need more than X concentration. Um, everybody is different. Everybody's conditions and symptoms are different. And so I think it would be uh, incredibly detrimental to the patients. I worry so much about these medical cannabis patients, you know, because the product just gets treated just not like, I mean, there are, there, I worry about my patients' access to all kinds of products and services, you know, but cannabis, physical therapy, you know, there, there are so many things that patients just can't access because they don't have the money. And the big question for me is, you know, if you're, if you don't have a green thumb and you can't grow your own, I mean, how can we assure that patients have affordable cannabis through dispensaries? Because every it, medical patients always say, I mean, always say in so many states that the medical cannabis is a joke, that it's, you know, it's, it's too expensive, the options aren't available, and uh, patients are always scoffing at the medical cannabis program. I, I mean, I feel like there's going to have to be some mechanism to subsidize this if we're going to rely on dispensaries, because I don't see how we can rely on dispensaries as, you know, income generating, uh, you know, businesses to, uh, to, to take a hit for uh, medical cannabis just um, in some sort of Good Samaritan rule or you know, I, I, I really do worry about the cost of uh, dispensary-based cannabis, and oftentimes it seems like the medical communities maintain the, the black market purchasing because of the limitations. Yep, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to costs, um, but I just want to stick with this idea first of, of, of potency and, and limits. But when you're getting that waiver in Iowa, doctor, so... Yes. You get the waiver to what? Is it to a certain limit again, or it's is it to uh, generally to 29 or 35 grams? You know, the Iowa products that are available immediately are lower in THC, and then uh, and then you, you you're allowed a gram amount of THC per month. So that go ahead. We'd be going back. Absolutely, it would be it would be creating that people would just drop out of the program to have to do that. Number one, our medical community is not prepared to do that. They don't know about what the products are at all. As far as I can tell, I'm sure there are a few uh, that do, but my experience has been, even when they're positive about it, they don't know about it. And having to go back to get a cap, I mean, we've looked at just the weight limits of flour, and you know, can a doctor say somebody needs more it, it doesn't fit within how our system has doctors speaking to the registry. They're not, you know, giving that kind of advice. And we would just send patients backwards to, to do that. The, we're really talking about, you know, uh, and a weight limit, it would just raise the price for them. They'd have to pay for more to get the same concentration. So, you know, the concentrates are being made now. There's no question we're going to be making concentrates at a certain level in order to make many of the products that are going to be part of the adult use market. Uh, so it is really an issue of legislative ethics, whether they understand this is medicine and medication. And, you know, as much as we have concerns about 
pharmaceuticals out there, you know, we have to let the doc, the, the patient, and who's providing the medication, in this case dispensaries, figure out what works. And we've been doing that, and we would be going backwards. And I think in that, uh, the, the legislation, legislators understand that we can't go backwards for these patients. That's going to make a big difference. And so there's no yeah. limit. Oh, Jim. Well, there's weight limits in terms right. of what you have, but here's a little crazy loophole. Concentrates weigh very little, even right. though they have right. lots of THC in them. So yeah. it, that's really the question, is the amount of THC you're getting. And, you know, uh, if uh, somebody could need 10, and that works, milligrams of THC, and somebody could need 150. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding. And not have any, you wouldn't know. <laughs> right. you know that they're on 150 milligrams. It's, it's like a narcotic. If you're in horrible pain, you're not high from it. It just works. So anyway, the limits are, are really, would be a step backwards. And I think we need yeah. to communicate that, that it's absolutely appropriate to look at it in the adult use market, but not appropriate to look at limiting it for an existing medical program that thousands of patients count. So the existing yeah. limits now are, are, are what, leave, leave those alone. They do, because if, you're, if your limit is two ounces a month of weight of medical marijuana, you can get concentrate usually within that weight that I believe that you need, uh, because it's a lower medical cannabis weight, but the THC concentration is higher. So there, you should get what you need at this point. There are, are definitely testimony I've heard that there are patients who don't get what they need, excuse me, sorry, uh, here in Vermont, and they go to Maine, and they go, you know, where you can get different concentrations, I guess. I, I'm not sure, but that, that's an anecdote. Okay, and, and we're, we're coming up on the period where we leave some time for public comment, but uh, Dr. Clifton, if you could, because I, I know you've spoken with some of the caregivers uh, as well, and just identify some of those concerns, which I, I think might be alleviated with just the, um, as adult use becomes more available and the, the increased availability of, of some retail outlets, but, but go ahead, Doctor. Sorry, you, you're just muted. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I knew myself. The um, the increased availability of retail outlets is going to be important. I think just the mobility of patients and the ability to get there to do their shopping, uh, but also the uh, you know the availability of uh, of um, well priced products uh, for for patients is uh, is going to be an issue for those patients who can't who who can't or don't want to uh, do their own home grows. And I think. Home grow is not a, a perfect option for everybody, but um, you know, I, the patients tell me that once you get uh, the initial cost in place, you know, the monthly cost of the electricity and and other issues can be as low as forty dollars a month, which is just going to be really hard to beat from a dispensary standpoint. So, for people who can do that and want to do that, that option is is an important option for us to retain for them. But and and then having you know more availability through the dispensaries and figuring out a mechanism for keeping the cost low. I and mean, we certainly hear from patients everywhere that you know it's hard to get to the dispensary and then the products are prohibitively expensive uh, in a, in a medical market. And it seems difficult for us, you know, even in even in a traditional Western medical model with you know insurance and all of the systems that we have been developing and having in place for so long it's really hard for patients to get their prescription medication you know and treating this like a medication i don't know it's hard i think to get to give patients great access i mean uh, uh through dispensary based products thanks doctor uh, and then just quick meg or jim are there other um, other issues with the medical program that that I didn't include in this that you want to you do want to address as, as we go forward that I include on the list. Um, I think kind of um, 
in alignment with uh, Dr. Clifton's point here with access, um, it, you know, it isn't always easy for patients to get to the dispensary as frequently as they may wish to. And so I would, um, I would advocate for either increasing patient limits or doing away with them, um, whatever really is in alignment with adult use. Um, you know, if there are not going to be any possession limits or purchase limits uh, for 30 days on adult use, I don't see why we would implement that in the medical market. Um, that's absolutely prohibitive to patients. Um, and then I know Jim had mentioned it, uh, but I think he mentioned it kind of in the opposite sense of patients from Vermont going to other states. But I think in order to uh, support the program, we really need reciprocity. Um, right. You know, Got Vermont it. sees, yeah. And testing okay yep. very um, yeah and, and if Meg you and both of you wanted to reach out uh, to your dispensary clients or contacts uh, to get work on getting some of the, that data on how to, to formulate that baseline for protection for the medical patients and then with that we have some time I want to make sure uh, any public participants that had any questions or comments had the opportunity to do so now Great. Um, so yeah, we have, I think, a few people in the room. Would anyone like to make a public comment at this point? Either of you? Oh. Jeffrey, come on in. Hello, everybody, again. Um, Jeffrey Pizzatello from the Vermont Growers Association and the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, uh, really here, I guess, uh, as um, a caregiver, um, just briefly, uh, I've been a registered caregiver in our program since its inception. Uh, I've been growing cannabis, and by the way, it's about 13 or 14 years. Um, so my patient and I have been on uh, since day one. Um, I've been growing cannabis for a couple of decades as well, myself, so quite some time. Um, I've been growing professionally for about a decade now. Uh, I just want to speak to uh, the ability and capacity to, for Vermonters to sort of sustain themselves and home grow. Um, some context. Think of Vermont as almost Northern California in its per capita for producers. We have more producers in this state than many other states per capita. One reason why is because we're an agrarian state. Uh, we've got excellent farmers. We've got excellent growers. We have a very robust, illicit marketplace right now. In fact, that is one reason why we're some, one of the very few states with a medical program where the numbers are actually going down. They're diminishing. And that is because it's being replaced by cleaner medicine that are, that's grown with confidence and comfort in someone's home. Um, I urge you to look at uh, the Maine uh, medical program, which has a decentralized market structure and that allows mom and pops to get in through accessible licensing. Um, as a result, their average cost per ounce is $200 to $250. In Vermont, it's $350 to $400. That's just the price of flour per ounce. Concentrates, anything else is exponentially more expensive and cost prohibitive for patients. So please keep that in mind. Uh, I would like to end with an anecdote. Um, when my patient first purchased concentrates from a dispensary, I'm not going to name it, she went to go uh, uh, Medicaid and the concentrate uh, reacted in a way that reflects um, a contaminant. So she purchased a very expensive oil from a local dispensary and it was contaminated. I sent it to a lab. It had mold in it. So this is one reason why uh, Vermonters are choosing to grow their own and not service dispensaries is because of the lack of quality. Uh, right now, our medical program, there is no burden of testing necessarily on these dispensaries. They test themselves. It's really more of a marketing item than uh, a, 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 an issue of uh, quality and, and cleanliness. So, uh, we will, uh, I've been working with, stepping back from that and those, those anecdotes, I've been working with Jessalyn Dolan of the Vermont uh, Cannabis Nurses Association and several other advocates across the state for a couple years. We have a 14 point 
uh, proposal for recommendations which we will submit to you guys that comes from the patient and caregiver community. In those proposals, we ask for things that Maine has. So for instance, a patient to caregiver allowance. So for every one patient, they can supply for up to five different, uh, uh, or rather for one caregiver can supply for up to five different patients, apologies. Um, so just things to keep in mind and I look forward to continuing the conversation in the coming weeks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to receiving that information. That reminds me, Mike, one of the, um, I, I think one of the recommendations you had in another testimony was regarding um, health care providers uh, being able to, um, or, or at least patients being able to get the recommendations from, from more than one health care provider or something to that effect. Am I confusing that with another state now? Um, it doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> so so you, you've got those liberties then in Vermont where, where you're not restricted by by the health care providers as far as... Tom, um, I think we have to have a like certain minimum relationship. I think it's three months with the health care pro provider. Uh, and a physical. Right. Yeah. And a physical, and it's an annual renewal. So, you know, if you're part-time in Florida, part-time in Vermont, you can't rely on your Florida doctor, I don't think, to get right. you a referral, right? Yeah, so there's absolutely right. those complicating factors, the three-month relationship, um, and oftentimes, the appointments thereafter, you know, if it's specifically to get this uh, verification, can be of greater cost to the patient. Um, and then there is the renewal. Each year, the doctor um, needs to verify that this patient still has this condition. Um, and so I think, you know, for some patients that we're seeing who are terminally ill or chronically ill, um, we have asked that there be a reevaluation of that process because yeah. if some. Right. Yeah, if somebody you know is has a chronic illness, disease, etc., um, we know that's not going anywhere. And so, I think putting them through this additional hoop is just one more barrier to access. Right. There is a whole separate industry in card, uh, in, in 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 medical cannabis card production in Vermont. Really. Um, and to some degree protects their patients from that industry with all of these, you know, because you can't do them telemedically. They have to be the currently available. The cards have to be done brick and mortar with somebody that you've established a relationship with. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, the renewal of these cards for chronic conditions annually, uh, you know, I, 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 it, it might be interesting to uh, create a waiver system where those renewals are less frequent. The problem is that you are using a powerful medicine and these patients should check in with somebody who understands using a medication like that, you know, uh, and, and checking in annually is really not that frequent and not that onerous. But the problem is, is that the check-in can't be done telemedically and, you know, it has to be done in this established relationship situation, which in some cases, if your doctor isn't uh, understanding of cannabis, I mean, the studies reveal that 70% of doctors uh, believe that cannabis may have value, particularly in terminal conditions, but only 30% of doctors really feel comfortable making the recommendation because their medical malpractice may not even cover them to allow them to do it. It's a special waiver in your medical malpractice and then you're limiting the number of doctors that the patient can go see in order to get their card and uh, you know that escalates the cost and the and the hassle factor substantially well uh, again if if there's something we want to recommend and reevaluate with respect to even if it's just for chronic or terminal patients uh, now's the time to do that uh, and for us to dig into that as well Great. Oh. I actually have okay. the 2019 report recommendations. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. 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 Okay. We are at time. Um, so I'm going to to adjourn and we will talk to you again on Monday. Um, thank you everyone for your time and service tonight. If I can get a second to adjourn, uh, we'll be all on our way. I'll uh, second. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for everyone in Vermont. 
uh, that's in the room for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.